hour here in Seattle. And so it's probably a good time for us to get started with uh, today's session. So um, I would like to welcome everyone to uh, this virtual information session for the molecular engineering program here at the University of Washington. Uh, my name is Al-Shakim Nelson. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry uh, at the university and also the director of uh, education for the molecular engineering program. So first, I'd like to just start with the land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And uh, also just to, um, to share some of uh, our, our norms here for this meeting, uh, first, uh, that we are all respectful toward each other. Uh, we are here to, to share and, and gain information. And um, you, know, you are more than welcome to turn your camera on if you'd like, uh, but also feel free to leave your camera off. We ask that everyone stay muted unless you are asking a question to reduce the background noise. If you have any questions during uh, this PowerPoint presentation, or even during the panels, uh, please feel free to share them in the Zoom chat window, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can. Um, you can also, during the panel discussion, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, you can unmute yourself then, and we'd be happy to, to answer your question. All right, so, um, so in this next hour or so, uh, what, we'd like to do is just to give you a quick introduction to the MOLI program here, and then uh, we'll have a, a faculty panel session that includes uh, three professors, uh, professors uh, Jesse Zalatan, James Carruthers, and Eleftheria Rumeli. And then uh, for the last portion of uh, this session, we'll have breakout room panels, um, two with the individual tracks that are offered, the biotech and the clean tech tracks. So these are both student panels and then we'll have a separate breakout room if you have any uh, administrative or, or uh, questions about the process overall. So the uh, Molecular Engineering and Sciences Institute uh, has been here for about 10 years, and this houses the uh, Molecular Engineering uh, PhD program. And the goal of this institute is to catalyze interdisciplinary research in clean tech and biotech. And uh, what's important here is, is the fact that this is interdisciplinary. So uh, with this MOLI PhD program, uh, we are trying to create the new next generation of scientists who can speak the language of multiple disciplines and to be that, that catalyst that can act between or the go-between uh, these different uh, these projects that can have uh, very different aspects of science to it. And so um, over the course of um, the molecular engineering program, uh, you might design and characterize molecules and, and systems of molecules, uh, model molecular system behaviors, or uh, control molecular constraints that impact uh, system functionalities. And you have the opportunity to do this across a number of different departments across the entire campus. So what might this look like for, for some of our students uh, well, the, the key here is, um, I guess, as some might like to say, a thinking small for a big impact, right? It's really about connecting uh, the molecular scale and molecular scale phenomena with uh, system level and, and engineering or macro scale events. And, and the goal is to be able to use this fundamental understanding to, to engineer uh, solutions to, to global grand challenges that exist today. A couple of examples might be uh, building a clean energy future by developing new perovskite nanocrystals, uh, fighting infectious diseases like malaria, or even um, treating brain disorders by developing new therapeutic or, or diagnostic materials. So as I mentioned, you have the opportunity through this program to uh, work with a number of different faculty members. Uh, this is just a subset of, of faculty members who have hosted uh, MOLI students in there or advised MOLI students in their laboratories. And again, this is across many different departments on the campus. And in many ways, this is a real uh, another real advantage 
of this program because it's not housed with a specific department, it, it's housed with the Institute. And um, with this, you have the ability to look at uh, potential faculty advisors from across the campus, but also outside of the campus as well. Uh, so in fact, we do have students who uh, perform their thesis work at uh, Fred Hutch or even uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. And so some uh, topics or areas of research in the biotech space have been uh, synthetic biosystem engineering, protein design, uh, biochemical reaction networks and devices, um, biomolecular engineering involving DNA and proteins, or uh, various aspects of gene regulation and signaling. And then in the clean tech space, uh, you have uh, folks working on material and device uh, functionality guided by molecular synthesis, uh, structure, structure effects on electronic and photonic materials, um, organic light emitting diodes and field effect transistors and other devices, uh, including electrochemical cells. Uh, and then with this training, uh, where, where, what do our students do? Where do they go? Uh, well, it, it's really up to you uh, what you want to do with this degree, but just some uh, examples here of what some of our students have done. Uh, we've had students go off to um, start their own company. Uh, they perform postdocs at different institutions across the country, or even just go and, and work uh, in industry. So um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but uh, with respect to the courses that you would take uh, during your time here, you, you, you will probably complete most of your courses within or all of your courses within the first two years of the program. Uh, but there are a core set of courses that are required for all of our MOLI students. And the, the goal of these core courses is uh, to help you learn the language. Right. So, so to understand the, the language that are used to describe molecules or the, understand the language that's used to describe uh, biological systems. And then uh, beyond that, uh, you take uh, additional um, elective courses that would uh, supplement these core courses that you take. Um, all, I'm not doing, going into a lot of detail here, but this information is available uh, through our website. All right, so uh, just a last bit of information for you here. Our application deadline uh, is December 15th of this year. Uh, it's also an another important point here is that the GRE is not required and the GRE is not used to assess applications. So even if you submit your GRE, we are not looking at your scores. Uh, if you are looking for additional information, please go to our website. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel at uh, UW uh, molecular engineering and sciences and great resources there, including a, a recent grad 101 panel, uh, I would encourage you to check out, uh, which was uh, actually organized by um, several of our students. Uh, we also are on Twitter. And if you have specific questions, please also feel free to uh, email us at this email address. Uh, and so with that, what I'd like to do is to then transition to the next part of our session here. I'll stop sharing uh, so that we can go to our uh, faculty panel discussion. And as we're uh, getting set up for this, I will ask uh, that each of our three faculty panelists uh, quickly introduce themselves with a short introduction here. Uh, so uh, Rachel, if we are good to go to um, the faculty panel, just give me a quick thumbs up here. Great, all right, so uh, then, um, so first, let's do this alphabetically. So, uh, so Professor Carruthers, if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to introduce yourself. Sure, I'm James Carruthers. I'm an associate professor of chemical engineering. I've been part of the Moly Institute uh, since almost it began about uh, nine and a half years ago. Uh, in our work, we do large scale computational simulations. We do CRISPR-Cas network engineering and we build Aptimer biosensors for applications in synthetic biology. Uh, we do a lot of our work with our uh, my good friend Jesse Zalatan, who's going to introduce himself last since he's got a Z last name there. So yeah. Great, thank you. And then um, uh, pr Professor Romelli, if you wouldn't mind just uh, briefly introducing yourself. Yes, thank you. My name is Eleftheria Romelli, and I'm an assistant professor in material science and engineering. Uh, so another department. Uh, I have been at the UW uh, less than two years and with Molly S 
maybe a little bit over a year. Um, my group is uh, working on sustainable uh, polymers and polymer biocomposites, um, as well as nanocomposites. And uh, some of the students already of the program in my first year have joined also uh, a class that I have in my department. And uh, I think that actually shows a little bit that, uh, of the exposure that you would get to multiple different departments as a student here. Thank you. And then finally, uh, Professor Zalatan. Hi, uh, my name is Jesse Zalatan. I'm an associate professor in the chemistry department. Uh, I'm secretly a biochemist by training who's hiding in the chemistry department. We do a little synthetic biology on the side. And so we hang out with the MOLES people as well. Um, I sort of broadly try to unify all the projects in my lab by saying we study how biological networks make decisions. Um, so we look at kinase signaling networks. Uh, we look at gene regulation. We build some CRISPR-Cas tools. We do a lot of collaboration with James to try to build uh, regulatory systems that we can use to improve biosynthesis and microorganisms. And we have got a couple wild ideas from there. Um, we do a lot of biochemistry and all sorts of other stuff. Um, I've had three MOLES students in my lab in addition to chemistry and BPSD students. And all of them actually, now that I think about it, joint with James. So all my MOLE students are joined. So we do a lot of a lot of collaboration. Um, and I want to give a shout out to our first MOLE student who graduated, Jason Fontana, who got highlighted as going off to start the company. So go, Jason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome stuff. So um, I'm actually really excited to be here with this faculty panel because I, I, I know these three pretty well, actually. And uh, I know that they're fantastic. And um, so may, maybe just to jump into this, um, you know, uh, uh, you know we, we, we have a lot of questions that we received uh, during the registration process and it, you know, a lot of students were affected by uh, the pandemic over the last year and many maybe did not have the opportunity to do research in a lab or you know, maybe not the traditional form of research that students might do. So um, you know, would you mind commenting on um, you know, whether specific lab experience is required um, to apply or to, to be in your lab. Uh, so James, if, if you wouldn't mind starting. starting yeah, well, I'm happy, happy, to, happy to kick things off. Well, you know, even before the pandemic, we actually had students in our group who had no uh, white lab experience. And uh, the very first student uh, that I ever had was actually a math major as an undergraduate. And, uh, you know, and he started doing computational work and by the end of it became an, a terrific experimentalist. Now, that's not to say that that that's the only route. I just mean to say, oh, I think there are lots of ways to do uh, to do terrific work. Um, uh, people who didn't have opportunities to do research in the lab, I would think, should spend some time thinking about problems that they're interested in. Uh, there may be ways to get to be involved in doing research, even if it's not wet lab. Uh, you know, contributing to working on review papers, uh, working, talking with graduate students, hanging out with graduate students, even if virtually. I think there, there are a lot of ways that, that this could be done. We now are starting to have undergraduates back in our lab and, and doing some shadowing and things. And I think that could even be an opportunity, even if you don't really have, if you can't, uh, can't quite get in the lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So, so James is uh, probably the most senior on this panel. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe let's ask uh, Eleftheria if you have some other thoughts. So Eleftheria, you've been here for two or three years now. Um, so do you have a, um, a similar or different opinion on that? Yes, only two years. Uh, and mm -hmm. I would say I agree exact, uh, with that uh, 100%. Uh, the PhD students that I have, have, that I have heard, the first one had absolutely zero laboratory experience. Uh, so, but he had done... Uh, computational theoretical work uh, with uh, in completely different materials. So in my group, we work with polymers. He didn't know anything about that, but it was a, a good fit and the recommendation letters and all of that showed that um, he was prepared for actually getting um, in this journey. And I would say that even myself, uh, I had zero experience or zero classes in polymers before I started my PhD. The very, very first day of my PhD that was on polymer and composites, I had to Google what a polymer was because I'm a trained physicist. So complete, I, I have exactly the same um, 
uh, expectations for students to be enthusiastic, show that they want to learn, but it's not mandatory that they, they cannot be experts in what they will be studying. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so so if I can move on to the next question, and maybe I'll pose this to you uh, first, uh, Jesse. Um, should students reach out to faculty before they apply? Yes, that was an easy one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Well, well, can, I think, can you talk about the process? So, how should yeah. they reach out to the faculty? So, so that that's 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 a that's a good question. Um, I think it's really <laughs> important when you reach out to faculty that your email for us or anyone else doesn't look like you just swap the name onto a form letter. So, when you're reaching out to faculty, ideally, you've at least looked mm -hmm. at some papers and have some idea why your background or interests make you a good fit for the lab. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to see, you know, some connection to why you're coming to, why you're interested in grad school and why you're interested in our projects. Um, so James or left area, did you have anything else to add to, to that? Or would you just agree? Oh Sounds yeah, like no, I, I, I just agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that having conversations with people before they apply uh, is is terrific, and I I always interact with people. I don't know, at least a, at least a handful of the, the incoming students before they've even applied, and then kind of throughout the journey, and then uh, you know, and then we finally get to to meet in the visiting day weekend, and then um, a lot of them end up being our students. So I think it's a, it's terrific to start start the conversation early. I would agree, but and say that this is the optimum. But I just to uh, also say that it's don't be discouraged if you reach out to some people and not everybody mm -hmm. has the time uh, to respond to everybody. Like does it, that doesn't mean don't stay. The Molly S is a great program because you have all of those uh, uh, mm -hmm. faculty lined up. It's not just that you have to uh, pick one and then go with them. So don't be discouraged if one does not respond or if you do not respond and keep going. Yeah, Al, how, how many Molias faculty are there? Are there? Oh, oh are, a lot. There's, are, yeah, there 100, I mean, are there more than 100? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah, I, right. I mean, pro probably well over 50. So, so there are a lot to choose from. And, and I guess to add to that, um, you know, for faculty members who are not affiliated with the MOLIES, I mean, they, they do have the opportunity uh, to gain that affiliation. So uh, really, there, there's no restriction to the sort of faculty that you would um, select. Yeah, I guess I'll just add really briefly, like, it's certainly not required to reach out. I mean, I say most students do reach out. Um, but, you know, some of my most outstanding students, one of them, I remember showing up on the first day of the fall quarter saying that she was interested in my group and I was like have I met you before but you know she turned out to be absolutely spectacular right so you know everybody does it a little differently so um what what do you what do you recommend students do um uh, professionally academically or otherwise in the time between submitting applications and uh starting the program and uh, so are, are there certain things that you think they should be doing to prepare themselves as a student in your laboratory? Or maybe this follows on, on the previous question, right? I think this is going to be a, a strange year for applications because, you know, we do typically see students coming in with a lot of research experience and, and this group may not. Um, so even after you've applied, I think it's really important to go out and get research experience in areas you think you're interested in. Um, and, you know, even after you're accepted into programs, use the summer to go get research experience. Some programs um, can provide opportunities to do summer research where you're going, or there might be research opportunities at your current institution or wherever. But I think getting a head start on figuring out what both you're intellectually excited about and you're happy to do at sort of the day-to-day -day bench level is really important. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, in, in previous times, I might have recommended even taking a little bit of break or something uh, I, that might still be a good idea. But but I think, you know, especially if you haven't been able to get the research experiences that you want in the last couple of years because of the pandemic, then, uh, you know, doing an internship at a company or uh, maybe even starting 
graduate school doing a, a summer rotation. I think there, there are some other ways to kind of uh, play catch up a little bit, if you will, and, and to, to expand the, your experience, the, the kind, the variety and the uh, kinds of experiences that you have. I think that could be really valuable. And I think most uh, faculty are going to be open to that and, and kind of, you know, looking to, to provide opportunities for people, especially if they haven't had them in the last couple of years. I would add that a couple of uh, the applicants that uh, started in my lab this year, for example, uh, they had been using the summer to join in the virtual, I guess, group meetings. Um, mm -hmm. Others that are that um, they are thinking about rotations. I think it's a good idea because research does not stop in the summer. So maybe mm -hmm. if you can uh, sit in a couple of group meetings or some special summer summer seminars. Uh, in our departments or uh, in other institutions, I don't know. Like this is also another way to get your uh, research experience without actually being physically present uh, in here. Yeah, I, I like. That. I think that's some great advice there. Uh, so, what are what are what are your thoughts? I guess somewhat related. What are your thoughts about taking time off before starting uh, grad school? like in the MOLI program. And uh, maybe if you can also um, similarly comment on maybe interactions with students you know, who have taken that time off or not time off, but you know, time to um, work in industry, uh, for example, before coming back to get their PhD. Yeah, so, I, I mean, yeah, I can take, take a stab at it first. I, I think that one of the great things about this program, you know, it's an interdisciplinary program that draws on lots of people, with lots of different backgrounds, lots of different interests. And I think that that an aspect of that is different, a variety of, of interests and backgrounds uh, kind of coming into the program, not just academic, but also uh, a lot of people who spent some time in industry. Some of those people uh, turn out to be some of the most successful students, um, but not not always. Lots of people also just go go straight from. Uh, we've had people straight from bachelor's degrees, from master's degrees, from companies uh, in my own lab, and I guess that's probably going to be the experience of, of most people uh, here as well. I, I think, kind of like the other panelists said, do the things that are interesting to you, and uh, and that. Um, allow you to grow, and those are likely to be good preparation for, um, for the MOLI program, I would say. I think it's very important to, for, because it's a personal, I guess, choice, uh, your PhD is going to be like an intense, long journey. So whatever you can do to mentally, I guess, prepare, it can be rest, it can be getting diverse experiences. It's really person dependent. I think it's important to for you to take to use the time because once you get in it's going to be intense and like um transformative so maybe you get you want to get in with as positive feelings and as rested mentally as possible so uh i'd like to move on to the next question because we're, we're coming to the end of our, our time on this panel and uh, that is um you know students have the option of applying to specific departments or they have the option to apply to the MOLI program. Um, you know, how do, so how do you kind of differentiate between uh, the students of these different programs? So students of your home department versus the students who are in the MOLI program. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so Jesse, would you like to, to take that one? Um. It's tricky. I would say I've had great students from all the programs I've affiliated with here, and they're all slightly different. Um, since nobody's mentioned it yet, one of the things I think is, so two things I think are particularly valuable about how MOLI works in practice. One is the access to a huge range of faculty. So there's so many students coming in who, whose interests span departments. Um, so having that, and most of the time that can be worked out, but at MOLI, yes, it's already worked out for you. You can join whoever's affiliated with the program or even people not affiliated. The other really great thing about MOLI is the full year rotations. Um, I think it's incredibly important, even if you come in knowing for sure which lab you wanna work for, doing that full year rotate, three different rotations and three different groups and getting experience. Al's nodding along, because I say this all the time and I'm arguing with our department about this. But anyway, rotations are awesome. Um, getting that experience, learning who's in other groups, who has stuff you can steal, who has expertise you can learn from as you get started on your actual project is really wonderful and particularly gonna be useful for the students coming in now who may have less lab experience than, than previous groups. 
Eleftheria or James, uh, thoughts on that? I think James should take it because uh, he has taken students <laughs> from multiple. I only have like a handful of them. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, our, the Moli, uh, yes, I, I would agree with everything Jesse just said. And, and I guess the other thing I might add is to say that all of our groups have draw students from multiple departments. And once people are in the groups, then, you know, it's a, at least the way that, the way that we do our, Jesse and I run our labs, everybody, collaborates and works together on teams uh, and you wouldn't necessarily know what the, what the distinction is, but I think the, the structure of the MOLI program, the core courses are terrific, the rotations are, are something that are really unique in engineering programs. So there, there are basic science or biomedical programs that have rotations, but by and large, there really aren't engineering programs that have rotations. So this is really something very special uh, to that program. And so, um, you know, I, I think that makes the, the MOLI program a great one uh, to be part of. We also have uh, kind of disciplinary programs that are that are terrific, kind of depending on what your um, what kinds of core classes you want to take, and and maybe if you thought a little bit about what trajectory you want to your you want your career, there might be some reasons to to be more focused on a, a narrow discipline than than something that's interdisciplinary. But um, yeah, I think you know, and and those are the kinds of things if you write to faculty and kind of ask them or talk with them about about what the upsides and downsides and for your particular case. I, I talk to people every year who ask me, well, how about Moli versus Kemi or, you know, can, can you walk me through that that decision? And, and I have those conversations with people um, a lot. So, yeah. But yeah. I would only add to that, uh, I'm sorry, Al, that, uh, that all the choice, that the choice is yours. And I don't think anybody is actually uh, <laughs> um gonna select from their department or favor i guess like for example for me i, I had one position i saw all the applicants molly s and msc in our department it didn't matter which program you applied to the which program you applied to is important for you what classes you're going to take if you want to do the rotation if you want a degree from um, chem chemistry chemical engineering material science or molecular engineering which is more unique i guess uh, so choice is yours yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that you know, the rotations and the opportunities that are presented in that first year are really important. You know, there are a number of students who are interested in Jesse, who's in chemistry, James in chemical engineering, uh, Georg Selig in, in electrical engineering. And you know, so you know, these are three very different departments, but through the MOLI program, you have the opportunity to, to explore all three. Mm -hmm. So um, so with that, I'm going to bring our our faculty panel to a close. And I just want to, to thank again our uh, faculty panelists for their time and participating in this session. So virtual, uh, virtual applause for the three of you. Mm -hmm.